Um, just before I get started, um, has anyone ever used processing before? Like show of hands? Okay, cool, some people have, that's awesome. So I'm not talking to people who are like totally strangers to it. Um, so I'm so excited to be here, honestly. Like um, I have literally been hearing about Cascadia JS for years. Uh, so it's really cool to be here and actually be presenting for you guys on a topic that I really like. Uh, and I wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge all of the organizers who've put in so much work to organize this. Like it's really not easy. So if we could just give a little round of applause for them. Thank you so much. So, um, my name is Elgin Sky, and apparently I have one jacket. Um, and I included a photo of me so that you would know that, in fact, I am not an imposter. Uh, do I look relatively similar? I, I think I do. Um, and today I'm so excited to be talking to you guys about creative code in the browser. But before I get started, I just want to give you a little bit of a roadmap of what you can expect um, over the next 20 or so minutes. So first of all, hello. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about me and some of the work that I do and how I use creative coding in my process. Uh, next, I'm going to try my very best to explain creative coding to you, or define it rather. Um, and I'm going to try to get you guys um, excited about potentially using creative coding in your own projects in the future. Next, I'm going to talk to you guys about P5.js, which is a JavaScript library that makes it really easy to do creative coding in the browser. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why I like it. And finally, I'm going to try to do a live demo of some coding to see like, actually the nitty gritty of how you get started. Um, you will be impressed by how easy it is to make cool stuff. So um, who remembers this, this little guy? Um, not the pineapple, uh, but rather MS Paint. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure about you guys, but I spent a lot of time with this program when I was a kid, probably because the internet wasn't like actually available at my house. <laughs> um, so even though I knew that I wasn't going to be the world's first millionaire um, from selling my bitmap images, I think it was like BMP that you'd save it as, um, I still spent a lot of time working on it. And as I was doing that, I was learning new skills. So I was learning how to do things, because kids and adults, we learn through exploration and play. And so while I was making these creative things, I was also learning how to use a mouse. I was learning how to work with color, et cetera, et cetera. And I can't help but think that maybe I'm here today, in part at least, and maybe for you guys too, because I had access to creative um, tech tools when I was a kid that let me um, just improve my skills. So. Um, flash forward a couple years, um, actually many years, I grew up, and I started working in the arts. And I actually came to coding because when I was working in the arts, I wanted to develop media arts projects. Um, so I started doing a little bit of stuff with like Max MSP, and I was hooked. Um, I really liked it, and so I decided to take a web development boot camp. Um, I worked in industry for a little while and then decided that I was not done with school yet. So when I got an opportunity to go back to school to do my master's of um, science and interactive arts and technology at Simon Fraser University, I jumped at the chance because it meant that I was going to be able to bring together sort of my two like main things that get me excited in life, art and technology, and sort of combine them into one. So my main research area is actually on child-computer interaction. So that's one of the reasons I mentioned MS Paint earlier. Um, but I also research tangible computing. And so what tangible computing means is um, manipulating digital information with physical objects. But one thing I'm really fortunate about, or really thankful, is that I actually get a lot of time to be doing um, creative projects when I'm at school. So in my off time, um, I do a lot of like, um, sort of like self-improvement projects by just like building weird things. And I also get an opportunity to work with a lot of undergraduates and graduate students who've never ever coded before, and I get to introduce them to it. So before I try to define creative coding for you, I want to show you some of these projects that I've worked on recently um, that I think I would define as being creative code. So this is Plantagachi. It is a smart planter, I guess is what you'd call it. And it's like a mix between a Tamagotchi and a planter. And so basically, when you're about to kill your plant because you haven't watered him in a couple weeks, um, he preemptively turns his eyes to X's. And then you're like, oh, I should take care of that. <laughs> Um, this is a brain-computer interface series of lights because you know everyone's ever, like always wanted to power a computer like a light with their brain. So it uses EEG sensors on the forehead, and then it changes the um, the color and the intensity of the lights. And the one that looks like a brain is actually one that um, it's like a miniature model of a large-scale project that we're doing with some other students. 
Um, and this final uh, example that I'm going to show you, it was inspired by my work with the um, Vancouver Laptop Ensemble. And what it is, is it's a laser harp. <laughs> so basically, it's a series of lasers. And if you put your hand in between one of the lasers, um, they'd ideally be further away. I don't have a good photo of it. But you put your hand in there, and then it triggers some code that's going to be making music. Or maybe not music, but uh, noise. <laughs> So uh, I'll get to the, the, the honest truth is that I kind of hate the term creative coding because all coding is creative. Like um, even if you're not working on these kind of weird projects, um, every time you're faced with a coding challenge, you have to maybe think of some sort of creative way to solve it. So for the purposes of this presentation, however, um, I'd like to sort of define it by two specific things. One is it's arts-based, and don't let that scare you. There's like an academic um, way you could look at it and say it's about making something that's expressive rather than a functional product. Um, not that my laser harp was not functional. <laughs> um, it just it was a bit more on the expressive side. <laughs> So it's art-based, um, but I prefer to think of it more as being tech that's fun, something that's exploring a new space, something that's maybe a little bit surprising or unexpected, or something that encourages exploration. And the other way I define creative coding is it's inclusive. It's community-oriented, and frankly, it's, oh, how would I put this? I, I had a great way of putting it, but. <laughs> Uh, basically, because it's so um, built around being, um, doing explorations and stuff, everyone is welcome to take part in it. Whether you're a professional developer like many of you, or whether you're someone who's just getting started in code, it's more about the process than the final product, and it's more about um, just having fun doing it rather than having like, the perfect code. And for that reason, it's a really great activity for people who are either brand new to coding, coming to coding from a different um, field, or someone who just wants to have some fun. And I would like you guys, in your mind, you don't have to do this out loud because I don't want to embarrass you, but you do not need to be an artist to be an artist. So repeat that in your brain after me. You don't need to be an artist to be an artist. <laughs> Um, when you're making art with code, what's really awesome is that you actually just need to tinker. Um, and that's all you need to do to be able to create some really fun and surprising things. A for loop in your JavaScript program doing something else might just iterate through some numbers. But in creative coding, it could actually make a pretty picture. Now, the examples that I showed you earlier were mostly hardware-based. And I did that for a reason. I showed you hardware-based things because I thought it would be really easy to comprehend how they were kind of weird, like kind of, to be honest, useless um, sort of examples. They're cool, but like they're not, they're not saving anyone's life. Um, but you can do it with anything. You don't need to have hardware. Um, you, can, you are all already JavaScript developers, so you can make interactive art in the browser yourself. You don't need to use MS Paint. You can make MS Paint. <laughs> um, and the other thing that I really wanted to, uh, I had another point on this slide, but clearly it wasn't that important. So I'm just going to skip over that. <laughs> I was like, don't forget that one thing. And now it's the one thing that I've forgotten. Um, no, it really it wasn't that important. <laughs> But before you guys go bursting out the door and starting to work with um, the SVG and the Canvas elements, which are really core to doing creative um, interactive art in the browser, um, I'd just like to point out that they're not always the most intuitive to use. Um, so I think it was actually just pointed out in the last presentation by Shannon that if you want to do stuff with WebGL, which is based in the HTML5 Canvas, um, you know, it's a lot of kind of crazy code that you've got to go through, and it's not always super easy, particularly if you're someone who's brand new to coding or if you're someone who's just doing it for fun. Like, no one wants to spend their weekend working on a project and, like, having to figure out all this, like, kind of code that's really uh, convoluted especially since other people have already made libraries and APIs and extensions and such that is going to make it a lot easier to do this sort of stuff in the browser. So some of the libraries that you might be familiar with are D3.js, um, which is a really awesome um, package for working to do data visualizations using SVGs. Another one that got mentioned in the last presentation is 3.js, which is great for doing like 3D rendering in the browser. But for me, personally, I really love P5.js. And so you might ask why. I love P5.js because it was specifically made to create art in the browser. 
And so the way it works is it makes it easy to work with the canvas element. It provides shortcuts, et cetera, that make it really fast and quick to create interactive um, data visualizations, games, et cetera. So these are some stale, um, some screenshots from a project that I did over the summer. Um, they're all animated and interactive, but I didn't have time to turn them all into GIFs for you, so my apologies. But you can see kind of like some of the pretty things that you can make in the browser. And so some of you have already, um, like I had you guys raise your hand and see who had already, <laughs> or who'd used processing. So P5 is actually um, based on processing. Um, so processing is a, an IDE, it's based in Java. And it's been around for almost two decades now. So it's been around for a while. And it is sort of like the go-to standard when it comes to creative coding. If you do a Google search of creative coding, you'll come up with processing. And it was really designed for artists and non-coders to be able to create visualizations super fast and easy um, without having to learn a lot of like, code that wouldn't be helpful within that project. Um, and the neat thing about processing is that not only is it easy for beginners to learn, it also, um, it's robust enough for professional media artists, for professional developers, and for professional um, inventors. So I've just grabbed a few stills off of their website of some of like processings, um, like gallery, in terms of like what you can do with that. So this is a data visualization. Um, this is some really cool generated scenes that have been printed out using ballpoint pens with CNC machines. And P5 brings this technology and the core ideas of processing to the web. So a few years ago, Lauren McCarthy worked with the Processing Foundation to not only bring over the syntax of processing, but also to bring over sort of the ethos. Um, and by that I mean um, the, it, it's a very inclusive um, organization. And so P5 um, aims to replicate that. So processing um, talks about how their game aim is to promote software literacy, visual literacy, and make these fields accessible. And they do a really great job through excellent documentation and a fabulous uh, YouTube channel called The Coding Train with Daniel Schiffman, which has like the funniest videos, I think, <laughs> on how to do computer science context, concepts from beginning to much more advanced um, in a really fun and accessible way. But for me, what's really meaningful, and one thing that I hope that you guys will take away from this talk, if nothing else, um, is that if you are involved with a, an open source organization, um, P5 has a really obvious welcome, welcoming statement, a community statement on their main page. And in that, it basically says, everyone is welcome here. And this might seem like just a little bit of text on a website that no one's ever gonna pay attention to, but it's something that you actually see referred to in the community quite often. So for example, we've got some screenshots here of people who are standing in front of presentations that have it up. Um, and also it's reflected in the discourse um, forums as well as the GitHub pages. And for me, this is really personal because I saw that statement, like I'm not necessarily, I'm not from a computer science background. I saw that statement and two days later I made my first open source pull request. Never done it, never considered it. But I saw that and I was like, oh, this can be my community. Um, as a result of that, I actually applied for and successfully got a Google Summer of Code position um, working with the Processing Foundation. So these words have meaning. Anyways, I'm gonna race ahead, do some demos, show you how it works. So the way that um, I'm gonna go through this is first I'm gonna show you some, just how to work with the raw canvas element without having P5, just for comparison's sake. Next, I'm gonna show you how to make a P5 sketch. That's uh, their word for a P5 program. I'm gonna show you a little bit about working with externals and interactivity. And then I'm gonna show you a little bit about plugging in uh, extra JavaScript libraries. Oh, wow, you don't need to know that yet. <laughs> Okay, so just for the interest of time, I've already, like, I'm not gonna code this part live for you, but when you work with the canvas element, has, have people here worked with the canvas a lot? Show of hands, so a lot of you have. Um, but for those of you who haven't, the way that it works is when you create a canvas element on the page, um, you've got basically just this like blank space. And anything that goes inside of the canvas is actually invisible to the DOM. So you can't um, style it with CSS or anything. You have to do all of the styling through JavaScript. So I've got sort of um, a very simple um, example here. So first of all, I have to find my canvas element using JavaScript. Next, I've got to tell it that I'm gonna be working in two dimensions. I'm not gonna be trying to do any sort of um, WebGL or 3D stuff. And then if I want to make it turn uh, to a different background color, 
then I've got to actually create a new rectangle that's the same size and shape as the existing canvas. And beforehand, I've also got to um, actually give it the RGB value. So if I hit save and refresh, I've got a nice pink block. <laughs> uh, and that's not too hard to do. Actually, that's not hard to do at all, but it starts to get a little bit convoluted the more complex the sketch gets. So I've got an example here of how to draw just a straight line. So this is gonna go from 50 across and 50 down to 100 across and 100 down. And it requires four lines of code. I've got to begin the path. I've gotta declare the first set of coordinates. I have to declare the second set of coordinates. And then I have to um, tell it to actually draw that. So when I hit refresh here, if I saved, Ooh, I've got a line. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, look, that wasn't hard. You could all do that. You could all follow along. You, you, you've got it. But as your sketch gets more complicated, that's going to become a bit of a nightmare. And if you are someone who's just learning code or just wants to make something in the end, like, that's going to be really frustrating to work with. So. That's where P5 comes in. Um, P5 makes this, a lot, this process a lot easier and a lot more intuitive. So P5. So the first thing you've got to do is download the P5 libraries to your computer, or you can get them via NPM. You could also use their P5 web editor if you don't want to download anything. And then what you have to do is there's two main functions in, in processing. There is the setup function and there is the draw function. We don't have to declare the canvas inside of the body of the HTML because that's something that P5 is gonna take care of us, for us. So I'm gonna create a canvas. I'm gonna make it the same size as the other one, 500 by 500. And when I want to change the background, all I have to do is use the syntax called background and fill in the color that I want. So that's already like one line instead of two, and it's a bit more intuitive because you don't have to build a whole, new, um, a whole new rectangle. So if I save that, I'm saving the wrong thing, and refresh, now I've got that pink square. If I want to draw the line, I just have to use the syntax of line, again, more intuitive, and I need to put the first coordinate, so 50-50, followed by the second coordinates. So 100-100. And if I refresh, there we go, I've got the same line, again, identical, but it's uh, significantly less code. And because it's got the two chunks, so the setup function happens one time and one time only, the draw function happens again and again and again, and it continuously rewrites over the canvas, it's actually gonna be super easy to start doing animations and more complex interactivity. So what's actually happening here is if we were to look at the P5 like core files that you're downloading, there's this, for the line specifically, we have a function that's already pre-made that basically runs through that same code that we were talking about earlier. So begin path, move to, line to, and stroke. So they've just taken care of that. They've abstracted it out to make it a little bit easier for you. Now, if you wanted to start doing things that were a little bit more interactive, you could add variables and stuff. You could add for loops. And that would allow you to do animations. So for example, if I do let x equals 0, and then let's make this. I want to have it move by a factor of x every time the canvas is refreshed. x plus equals 30. Save and refresh, and we should have a pretty cool animation going on. OK, it's still pretty simple. <laughs> um, but we can also do different shapes. So if I wanted to do an ellipse, and I can also use my mouse events, so do stuff with externals really easily. I could get rid of the outline that normally goes around an ellipse. And I could give it a, some sort of fun color. So fill blue, that sounds pretty fun. And if I save that now and refresh, ta-da, I have in three lines of code basically created my own MS Paint, like right here, right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So yeah, that was just like a two minute exercise. I made, I made MS Paint. But what if we wanted to make it a little bit more cool than that? Um, if we doubled up on this ellipse, for example. Um, the fun thing about code, as I mentioned, is that you can just sort of throw in extra things and see what's cool. So if I tried to add another fill, or another 
ellipse to the page, and then maybe I made the color random. So this is gonna, instead of giving me one value for red, it's gonna give me a different one every single time that the frame refreshes. Like all of a sudden, I have this like really satisfying and kind of beautiful like drawing tool. And again, this is just a really simple like sort of example. Um, you could extend on this like really easily and make some really cool interactive art pieces. Um, four minutes left, okay. So I'm gonna just jump right into another example. Okay, so this one, I'm not gonna have a time to walk you through the code, but basically it's using that same ellipse, but instead of using the mouse coordinates, what if I was to use my face? So that's gonna create a new, more interesting sort of interaction with the computer. So if I go P5, um, PoseNet, so this uses machine learning, um, the machine learning TensorFlow.js um, library PoseNet. Um, <laughs> just has to load. So right now, instead of drawing the ellipse on my mouse, I've actually got it drawing on my nose. <laughs> just really satisfying. And that didn't take a ton of code. I just had to use, um, there's a really great um, website called Friendly Machine Learning for the Web. It was, I think, actually part of um, ITP, which is related to processing, like it's the, a school in New York, but Daniel Schiffman, the person I did, the, I showed you the YouTube pages for, I think he's involved with this project. Um, and so all I had to do was add this plugin and this little, um, this little thing that's gonna loop through any bodies that are on screen, it's gonna be like, oh, is there a person there? If so, give me the coordinates of their nose. Now, <laughs> okay, this is still like not the coolest thing, but I actually wanna use this um, like PoseNet in a real project of mine. Um, and so I decided to do some like messing around with it the other day. Um, so I want to unveil to you my um, 80s music video generator, which I hope is gonna come up. Yes, it works. Okay, so for the very first time, live in person is my coded music video. Away, it, it gets bored and it turns off. <laughs> and I don't even want to admit to you how many times I practiced this part of the presentation at home. <laughs> Street, he says, Why am I soft and little now? So, this is, thank you. Um, this is just using that, po that same PoseNet, um, basically the same code I just showed you where instead of doing a circle at the mouse, I'm doing it at my face, but I'm also doing it on other po points on my body, and I'm jittering the circle that's around my head and on my shoulders to make it look kind of cool. The reason there's sort of ghost artifacts in the background is because I set the confidence level of the machine learning tool to be really low, so like, it's basically like, could that, is there any possibility, like, out of like, uh, like, is there is like 1% possibility that's a human, so when it sees my wrist, it's like, oh, that's a person. <laughs> Let me draw a person for you. You could set that higher so you wouldn't have that, but I kind of liked that it gave that sort of weird psychedelic look. So I'm running out of time here. So I just wanted to reiterate, what have, what have we learned today? What have we covered? So we talked about creative coding and how it's art-based and inclusive, at least if you ask me. <laughs> you don't need to be an artist to do it. Um, P5 lets you bring processing technologies to the web. Community statements are awesome if you want to get new people involved in your community. Um, and it's super easy to get set up and running, as I demonstrated right here. Um, I hope that you guys maybe feel inspired to try it yourself. I remember what I forgot to tell you earlier, is that you might learn something while you're doing it. <laughs> See, that, that was important, that was like pivotal. Because you're not just sort of like messing around. I mean, you are, you're messing around. You're just like playing. But at the same time, you might learn how to do a new, like use something new in JavaScript. You might learn how to use something like PoseNet, learn a bit more about uh, machine learning. Or you might um, become more involved with the community and be able to learn more about mentorship through helping out other people through that community-oriented sort of um, discussion forums and such that they have. So if you do want to try it, you don't have to download anything. You can go to their website and check out the P5 at web editor. If you want to download the PoseNet code, it's on ml5js.org. 
If you know someone young or want to pretend like you're underage uh, and want to learn more, um, I'm doing a workshop on Saturday morning on how to use this. So send your kids and your friends' kids my way. Um, so th thank you. And if you want to reach out, my uh, Twitter handle is ElginSky, or you can say hello to me here or on the Slack channel. Um, you can tell me um, how offended you were by my presentation, or you can send me your favorite GIF. GIF, 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 I don't know. Thank you.